Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's webinar, uh, where we intend to demystify loudness for you. Uh, well, actually, the, the actual demystifying is going to be done by a really good friend and a colleague of ours, Mr. Shrijesh uh, Nair. Uh, but before we kick that off, I would like to clarify a couple of household rules. Um, cameras and mics are disabled for all participants, uh, as well as the chat. Uh, but we do have a Q&A section. You will find that Q&A section, uh, well, actually under the Q&A button uh, in the webinar. Um, and you can post uh, all your questions there. We will try to address at least the most frequently asked ones at the end of the webinar. Um, and um, well, as we're about to kick off, uh, the geek level is going to jump up just a tiny little bit, uh, not too much, but uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to our host, Mr. Rob Allen, for the rest of the webinar. Rob, over to you. Uh, thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to another uh, in our series of webinars. As you all know, we're in lockdown. Uh, we've been thinking really hard about this. and. One thing that's clear to me, I think, is that however, we, however our industry emerges from this lockdown, live streaming is going to be a big part of it. Um, whether we like it or not, I think it's here to stay. And uh, in order to successfully mix for different broadcasters, for different platforms, we need to understand loudness. And, and to do that, I've invited my really great friend, Sri, uh, who knows more about this than anybody else I know. Um, Film mixing legend, award winner, makes hundreds of films, biggest brain in any room he's in. How you doing, Rishi? Good to see you, man. You and all good, man. All good. All really good, Rob. And thank you so much as well. I mean, you've put me on a much higher pedestal than I actually am, I would consider, assume. <laughs> You're on the, my highest pedestal of geekdom. Um, so listen, uh, okay, let's just, you know, let's get straight into it. We've got a lot of stuff to cover, so much detail. Um, What's loudness, Shri? Well, you know, that's actually a really good question, Rob. And I think the best way to answer that question is by looking at the definition of loudness as well. Um, but before I get into that, I would personally want to thank all of the people who have joined in on the webinar as well in this time. You've invested your time and you spend a lot of your effort trying to get into this. And I hope you walk away with a really good understanding of the concepts over here and we demystify this, as Rob said. So. That's a big mysterious question, isn't it, Rob? What is loudness? And the textbook definition of loudness is actually, you know, it's a characteristic of a sound. And the main thing about loudness is it's psychological. So it's a psychological correlate of a physical strength. So if something is psychological, you know, it means it's going to be different for you and different for me, right? So it's not just a peak level thing we're talking about here, is it? No, 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 no. A peak level is completely different because if it was peak level, you know, like a footstep would be louder than a scream. You know, a footstep has a higher peak, but it's not that. And that is one of the uh, most beautiful things you'll actually see in the way this is executed is how is something that is very subjective and completely varies from person to person taken up and standardized. In, in fact, it's come to a point where you can actually put a number to it. And that's really beautiful. So if you look at loudness and if it's a psychological correlate, there are certain things that affect us in terms of what loudness is, for example, right? So if you look at this, so sound pressure level, absolutely. If you have a lot of SPL coming towards you, I mean, you mix a lot of live shows, right? You know that something yeah. is loud when there's a lot of SPL that is there. And that's very important as well. Sound pressure level is something that influences. Frequency contents, absolutely. Because if you were playing a very low frequency, you can still have a conversation. Whereas if someone's playing a distorted guitar or distortion guitar, it would be very di slightly difficult to continue the conversation yeah. at that point, right? Because so, the, the high the high mids is what makes it feel kind of uncomfortable and loud, right? That's you know, yeah, I, I can see that hmm. why that would be a loudness thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and logically, it it clashes with the frequency in which we speak as well. So frequency contents and duration as well. How long are you subjected to this, right? So if you I've done, I've felt this very often in my <clears throat> film mixes as well. As I mix for longer times, I notice that towards the end of the day, the mix tends to get louder because I tend to hear, you know, get used to the loudness. So duration is another thing that is very important. So we have um, sound pressure level, frequency and duration. Now, there are certain other things like, you know, gender, for example, um, uh, culture so, is another thing. So how, how would culture affect it? How would, how, I guess, Okay, yeah. How would cultural? How will culturally we hear loudness differently, then? 
Uh, because the more you're exposed to certain upper mid sounds consistently, like for example, traffic noises are different from country to country. The music itself is different from country to country. You know, sure. uh, in, in general, you know, conversational pictures are different from country to country and culture to culture as well. But we can't, because they're extremely subjective, we can't take those and put a number to that. But these three factors we can definitely take and put a number to this. So, so if we you try, look at we try our best to put off we try our best to put some mass to this right but and and you know it's, it's hard to put a number to a, a subjective experience though surely yeah and that's how beautifully this was executed and when you when you look at the story of how this went from taking something that is subjective and actually putting a number it's 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 really mind blowing so the first thing is let's look at sound pressure level and because it's subjective we take one of these aspects and look at it so this is what we call on, the Fletcher Mansion. Hang on, before we go there, what's a font apart from being a character in Happy Days here? Now you've <laughs> <the corner>. So, <laughs> so a phone is um, is defined as. So let's say you're talking about forty phones. Yeah. So forty phones means you're playing a uh, one kilohertz tone at forty dB SPL. So that is forty phones. If it was sixty phones, you're playing one kilohertz tone at uh, sixty dB SPL. Now, the way this curve, so this is the ISO 226-2003 curve, and in fact, the oldest, the earlier version of that we know it as the Fletcher Munchen curve or the equal loudness contour. Now, the way this is designed is, so if you look at the line of, say, for example, 40 phones, and how it works is, if you are playing a 1 kilohertz tone at 40 dB SPL, what it means is, in order for you to hear 100 hertz at the same intensity of 1 kilohertz, you have to boost it by around 24 and a half dBs. Ah, okay. And if you, what is also interesting is if you go uh, higher on that, if you go to like, um, let's say up to 80 phones, what that means is you don't end up boosting the lower frequencies that high. It's only 12 and a half dBs high. So one thing we understand is our response to frequencies changes on the SPL level as well. Oh, and that's why, so that's why it dips on the high mid there because we're, we're more sensitive to those high mid frequencies. Exactly. So if you All look right. at the 3K, you actually have to lower it down compared to the 1K if you want to hear it in the same intensity. So this is how you, you kind of have SPL that is part of this thing. And here's a very interesting way of looking at this graph as well. So if you notice that you have to boost the low ends in order to have it equal to the 1K and you have to cut the upper mids in order to have a 1K, yeah. you could kind of call it like an effect that like, or like, you know, it's not right to call it an EQ, but it is like a filter that you have in your heads, isn't it? It so looks if, a little bit like the EQ I would kind of probably put on a, on, on a PA system, to tell you the truth. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, especially on vocals. I can recognize right? that curve, yeah. Maybe Cut apart from the, the 1K, whole... yeah, maybe apart from the 1K yeah. thing, but yeah. True. Interesting. And, and, and an interesting way of looking at that is if you flip this curve, you know, you have kind of a high pass, you have a slight boost on the upper mids, etc. And this is kind of the effect that we have in our minds. When we get a signal, you know, we, we don't uh, consider the low ends for loudness and we get a lot of prominence towards the upper mids. And if yeah. you were to trace this line, you would get a curve that looks pretty much like this. You know, there's a high shelf and a low cut, right? It, it looks similar to the curve that we see on the, uh, on the equal loudness contour just behind this. So now, this, this, is a, this is a kind of way to humanize the frequency response, right? It's a way to draw a curve that goes, this is how human beings respond to frequencies. Is that a, is that a fair yeah. assessment? Yeah, like, like you can call it, this is our hat, you know? Like this yeah. is what we hear through. And this is interesting because this curve is actually made up of two components. You have um, pre-filter stage one, which is the high frequency um, shelf boost. That is intended for the effect of the head. Um, and you have a low cut, which is an, which is an RLB filter. Uh, it's a revised low frequency uh, B-weighted filter. So if you look at this curve, this entire curve that you see right now is called a K-weighted filter. Okay. And this is what, so this is how we went from SPL to extracting the frequency shelf or the weightage that we need to have for this. So this is the effect that our heads will have on the signal uh, that we're going to measure. Because yeah. we need to find a way of understanding how, as people, we, we look at loudness, right? How we, how, we, how we respond to loudness, yeah. That's a yeah. curve to say, this is how we respond to loudness. This is the kind of psychological element of it. And we deal with True. that with a filter, yeah. 
True. And this is, if you, if you take all of those elements and you put it like in a block diagram, like if you look at it stepwise, you have the signal that's going out of your console, it goes into the filter, mm -hmm. and then you sample that. Um, that because we only understand this in terms of intensity or power, right? So okay. you sample this every 400 milliseconds. You you find the mean square of that. That gives That's you kind of like intensity. an RMS, almost something like that. Kind of yeah, similar kind, kind of, of like an RMS. Volume. I mean, an RMS you would define it, you know, in a way like the area under the curve. But yeah. this is also pretty similar. It's just that you have kind of our head filter or the K-weighted filter before that. Sure. And because we understand in terms of dBs, this is converted into a dB value. And this value is then the ten, the 10 log 10, just to be clear, the 10 log 10 is just a way to, to, to get the math of the, the dB. Yeah, scale. yeah, that's so where you log, convert that. Logarithmic, yeah. Yes. And then this is averaged over time. So you can see how we've gone from SPL to frequency to duration. Yeah. And this is, this is pretty nice because once you've seen this, this is what it comes out to be. Oh, for God's sake. Okay, this is where we get our geek on. Here's big complicated maths. Uh, and I understand yeah. the uh, understand the picture and a, beneath it. And a bunch of uh, symbols as well. I mean, like, I, I, I understand the expression of the cat very well as well. Um, but but you um, never thought we are going to get cute cats on this webinar, right? <laughs> <laughs> so there's the key value. I can see that. Loudness K. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So explain some of the rest of it to me, Sri. So here's, here's the good part about this. You will never have to come across this equation ever as a mix engineer. That's, that's one thing you can take off your chest. And the next thing I want to do as from my end is to try and explain this in simple English or simple language with just very minimal maths, like fifth grade maths, the max, okay. so that you can understand once you see this, it kind of translates into how, what tools you would use. And that's actually a very interesting thing. So if you were to take the, um, the figure that we saw earlier, right? You have the signal coming in, it goes through your filter and the mean square and all of that there is one component that is added in addition to the K filter, and it's called a weightage. Now, why do we have um, a weightage? That's actually a very interesting point. Um, traditionally in live sound, you mix um, stereo channels, right? You only send two tracks out, but all yep. of the concept of loudness comes in from the broadcast world. It comes yep. in as a part of a post-production um, uh, workflow. Sure. So in that world, you also have um, surround sound, so if you're mixing five channels or 7.1 channels or something like that. And I assume right now, in, even in the live sound world, you have a lot of um, push towards immersive mixes as well, yeah, am I right? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're definitely moving towards some object-based workflows that, you know, as you know, some of our bigger speaker companies are, are, are doing that. And uh, it's something that I've had a little play with as well. Actually, right. we had a little play with that together, didn't we? You and me spent three yes. days in a mix studio mixing an Atmos, but that's another story. Um, that was nice, wasn't it? <laughs> So if you look at this, you will see that the left surround and the right surround actually have the signals boosted by one and a half dBs. Um, one, of the, one of the lines of thought behind that is the fact that you are more susceptible towards loudness that comes in from your surrounds rather than the front because they're out of your field of vision. So, sure. you know, if something is out of your field of vision and if you were looking at it, let's say you were in a forest and you were looking at it in terms of danger, you know, you would be more attuned to something that you can't see because then your something mind is just... sneaking up on you from behind. Yeah, yeah. So, you, yeah. so, so that's yes. the thing that's been put in for the left surround and the right surround. And you would okay. notice that we're not measuring the subwoofer because, you know, if you look, if you remember the, the K-weighted filter, we don't have a lot of the low frequencies that we're measuring up. But... You know, there are discussions uh, on this, whether you need to include that or you don't need to include that. But for now, the standards don't require you to measure the subwoofer. Cool. Right. So we have this part and we understand this. So you have the signal coming in, we have the head effect and we take the average and we, as we, have, we put in a weightage for where it's coming in for us. Yeah. Now, the next step is all of these signals are going to be summed. <clears throat> that is a big sigma that you see. So they're all yeah. going to be added up converted into a db value which is a 10 log 10 and yep. the integrator is where you start so you want to measure let's say if you want to measure your song you started when the song starts and you stop it when the song ends or if you want to measure the whole program you started when the program starts and you stop it when the program ends this is exactly what this equation tells you and okay. that's pretty yeah it's pretty amazing because what you see as the z value is basically the complete power which goes through the weightage, which is then summed up and converted into a dB value, 
that is averaged over time, which we can see. So in a way, if you were to explain this equation um, in a simple way, it would be like, you know, it's just basically a dB representation of the intensity of loudness over time that we experience. Yeah. That's it. It's very, it's, it's very interesting. And there is one little uh, uh, extra thing here for all of the, um, uh, all of the geeks out here, if, you, if you're like me or Rob as well. So you see there is a minus 0 0.691 that's there. And okay. uh, <laughs> that's actually, it's, it's actually very interesting because the minus 0 0.691, if you look at this graph, you would notice that, you know, it is not exactly zero at 1K. It's slightly higher in terms of the filter. And the minus 6.691 actually comes in from a signal frequency of 997 hertz. Because when you're measuring, although traditionally we just send a 1K tone, if you want yeah. to measure all of the bits, so if you're looking at a 16 bit, you know you have 65,536 you know, quanta values. Yeah. And if you're sending a signal at, let's say 48K, you have 48,000 values, right? In, in one second. In order to use the most number of bits, it has to be a frequency that is, n that is not divisible. That is not a factor. Ah, so 997 is just like the nearest prime number to, to 1K. There you have it. Yeah, that's the nearest prime number. So Beautiful. at 997, it, you, know, you need 0 0.691 dB to make it zero. So okay. that is the 0 0.691 that is there. So it's, it's not basically so scary after all down. this. Yeah, I, I think I pretty much understand this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's simple, cool. right? So if, yeah. if, you're, if you're looking at this, you're basically taking everything that's around you, the way it hits your ear, the, the way your mind processes it, and you, you look at it in terms of intensity over time. Beautiful. That's it. It's, it's, it. it's actually pretty simple. And this one is the definition of LKFS. So LKFS is, a num is, is, is kind of a unit that you will see very often. You know, you'll see like they'll say 20, minus 23 LKFS or minus 14 LKFS. Yeah. Um, there are other terms that you'll see. We'll, we'll come to that as well. So LKFS means it's loudness, which is K-weighted because of the weightage that we saw, yeah. and reference to full scale. So okay. when you reference something to full scale, your value is always going to be negative, you know, because the highest okay. value you can have is zero. Zero. So for example, dBVU, of say plus 20 dB, right? Which would be the, the, the clip point in, in a full scale, roughly just. Yeah, so would, in, in would be zero, zero in full scale. I remember when we, we first brought yes. out the D show, we'd record to Pro Tools, we'd be looking at DBVU when we were on our desk and then we'd go to Pro Tools, which was at that time was a DBFS. And everybody go, right. oh, wow, it's not, it's not recording loud enough because it, you know, because we'd be recording, you know, we'd be having it through our desk at plus three, plus five, and then it would go to the DBFS and it would be like minus 15 and people would be freaking out. Well, that's, um, that's interesting. But of course, that's only two bits, right? In a 24 bit yeah. recorder. Anyway. And, and also the reason you have this I value is because, you know, you can go from stereo to 5.1 to 7.1 and it just basically scales the whole equation. So if you're looking at stereo for your mixers, you know, you don't really be, need to be concerned about what goes into the surrounds, uh, for example. And that's actually a good thing. So if you mix um, immersive media, if you mix for surrounds, one thing it'll tell you is if you have more elements in your surrounds, your loudness value is going to go up um, yeah. as, a, as, a, as, a, as a trick. From, from, so our, this... from, from our world, like we tend to mix you know, as, as, as you've already stated, the majority of our concerts are in stereo. And even if they're in stereo, we tend to mix pretty centrally, pretty mono, mono based mixes okay. because, you know, people are stood in front of or sat behind a, right. a side of the PA, some of the people. Yeah. 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 True. True. Yeah, makes so, yeah. Sense. So it's not going to be an issue for us. So we're, in terms of, you know, mixing for live uh, to loudness, central, you know, the, the more kind of center weighted your mix is the better yeah. really, in a way, right? Yeah. And this is basically the 1770-1 um, um, uh, method that's been put out by the ITU. So the ITU is the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, the R stands for the Radio Communication Section. DS is Broadcast Standard. And you have 1770-1. So okay. when it means dash one, you logically assume there's dash two, three, and four as well. And there are. And there are slight changes, which we will see, which is also very interesting the way those changes will come out. Okay. Um, this looks fine. So basically this is like a recipe. So the recipe tells you like, okay, now this is what you need to cook for one person. And then when you get that, you have to decide, are you going to cook for one person? Are you going to cook for 10? And so you have to decide what to do with this, right? Okay. So the ITU gives you this standard 
and its bodies like the EBU or, you know, if, if you're streaming, for example, for YouTube, you know, YouTube decides, okay, this is the value that we want to follow or Spotify decides this is the value we want to follow. And every broadcaster has their own values they want to follow as well. So, so it might be a different LKFS, but, but now we understand what LKFS is. We can, yes. we can, we can, we can, it might be a minus 14 or minus 24 or whatever it is, but it's, but we understand how we derive that value. Yeah. True. Yeah. And that's, that's the fundamental thing. So there was an issue. Of course there was. <laughs> and it, it was interesting because you wouldn't, you would not notice that instantly, right? I mean, you start off, you, you, let's say you're doing a show, you start measuring at the beginning of the show, you stop at the end of the show, you have a value, right? But there's another very interesting thing that happens is in between the show, you have silences. Yeah. Right. So this was the big thing in broadcast as well. So in between um, things, there were silences. And what happens in silences is if you don't account for the silence, your overall value can actually come down because, you know, the average comes down, right? If you have, let's say, 10, 10 people in a class and five of them have 10 chocolates, you know, the average chocolates is five. Yeah. So in our world, it would be an LEQ. So we're mixing at a festival. We're told the limit is... 90, 98 dBA with an LEQ of 15 minutes. So, so within that 15 minutes, we'd average out all of, all of the, the, the dB levels, dBA. Yes. Uh, in, yes. Including the, the time, the quiet bits and songs, the silence between songs. Yeah. Yes. And this and is that's, exactly the same here. Yeah. And that's the thing. So LEQ does not consider silences. Yeah. So LEQ just goes straight off. You, know, you start and you stop. But it's good because one thing, if you've noticed, you're using the term averaging a lot. And that is a yeah. key thing in mind it is averaging out um, so you don't have to be concerned if your number shoots up or is too low in the beginning because you can always average that out so the issue was this there is no you can't account for silence right so what happened was the way this was fixed was the so the ebu or the european broadcasting union they took these values and what they did was they put a gate so it's like, you know, like when you mix, you have gates, right? You use the gate on a kick um, as well so that you don't have bleeds in. It's the same thing. They put a gate saying, and that gate then goes to the integrator. And the way they put the gate was, if you have a reference level, let's say um, your, your your target is, uh, let's say, let's say you want to hit minus 23 or whatever. That's your average program loudness at that point. Mm -hmm if the value falls in this case, minus eight LU and one LU is just like one DB. So okay. let's say you, you have a number of minus 20. So minus 20 uh, LKFS. So minus eight would mean it would become minus 28. So the yeah. moment the value falls below minus 28, it would pause the measurement. It won't stop it. It would pause it. Mm -hmm. So that means you're measuring, measuring, measuring silence is paused, measuring again, measuring, measuring, measuring. So yeah. you're not, you're accounting for the silences. And this one is what the EBU R128 standard is. And you will see this in, in like loudness measurement plugins and, you know, all of those standards as well. Yeah. This yeah. is the EBU R128. And this value is called the LUFS. So at this point, if you remember, the original LKFS of the 1770-1 did not have a gate. Yeah. Whereas the LUFS measurement has a gate. So LU just stands for loudness unit reference to full scale. So... Then what happened was the ITU took this into consideration and they bought out 1770-2 in which instead of 8 LU, they kept it as 10 LU. It's just slightly easier to calculate as well, I guess. Easier to do the math of it, yeah. Yeah. So this was how 1770-2 came about. And this was, so when you have 1770-2, they also have a gate and the value was again LKFS. So th this is one of the confusions you might see occasionally, like if, is it LUFS, is it LKFS? they measure the exact same thing because it's exactly the same equations. It's exactly the same filters you're going to use. Everything is exactly the same. It's just different units. That is that. Now, this is all fine, but as a mix engineer or as the person, because at the end of the day, you have to deliver a good mix that sounds good yeah. everywhere. Yeah. You know, we don't need to concern ourselves with, with all of these values and equations and, and all of that. What we need to know is how do we, deliver a good mix and how do we understand uh, what to look for? You know, that is key, right? Yeah. So the EBU took these things and they came up with these few um, uh, definitions as well. And you will see this in meters, uh, in, in all of most of the meters that you look around, you will have something that is called the momentary loudness. Yeah. 
if you look, the momentary loudness, we were talking about the 400 milliseconds, so it's measured every 400 milliseconds. And I've seen, I've seen these values on, on, on meters before when I've been in TV studios and had just the vaguest idea of what they mean. So this is great that you're taking us through this. So yeah, thanks. For yeah, and, and, and this is also pretty useful because it's very logical once you understand this. So yeah, momentary loudness, it's 400 milliseconds. And the key thing to note is it's a sliding window. I'll show you what a sliding window is and why it makes sense. Then you have short term loudness, which is three seconds, which makes more sense because three seconds is roughly around, you have the length of a phrase, right? I mean, it's musically right. At, yeah. 400, at 400 milliseconds, it's too short to understand a lot of those things as well. So it's like then a you have, of bars, it's a more kind of musical measurement, isn't it? Momentary, yeah. so. Yeah. And it also gives you a feel of what it is uh, at that point, you know, understanding like, okay, like this is what we're looking at. Yeah. Then you have integrated value, which is the entire program loudness. Now, in this case, like I said, we have to account for silence, right? And that's why you have two gates. Um, I'll explain the gates as well. And the integrated value is what you finally look at. So if, you know, a lot of times you do these shows and then you have to come back and then mix them uh, for broadcasters or yeah. maybe you might be streaming your shows, you know, live as well. So you look at, you keep your eye out on the integrated value as well. And that's also a good thing to, uh, to keep in mind because there are some very interesting tricks and techniques that you can work out with that. And the last one is loudness range. Loudness range is because if you understand dynamic range, right, it's between, there are many diff definitions of dynamic range. It can be the, the peak to the, uh, the, the, the RMS or the peak to the noise floor. And, you know, there are many yeah. definitions of dynamic range, but it's always a peak value to something. And the loudness range is slightly different from that. Now, when it comes to music, there are, uh, because this is a broadcast term, there are other variations that you would see. There are some really good AES papers out on that as well. So you have the peak to loudness ratio. Uh, you have the peak to short term ratio as well, which you will understand in, in just a few seconds. Now, let's look at uh, what these measurements are and how these are measured. Because only if you understand how these are measured, you will understand what those numbers mean on the meter or the plugin that you're looking at. Yeah. So. You know, let's say this is the the piece of audio that's there, and you know these. Let's say you have these grids, um, and each grid is like hundred milliseconds wide. So what would happen is, you take a four hundred millisecond measure. So you, you measure all of the samples across four hundred milliseconds. So if you were doing it at let's say forty eight sample rate, forty eight kilohertz sample rate, that would mean like you have forty eight um, samples per millisecond. So it's like uh, nineteen thousand two hundred samples at that okay. you know, that one block and you average out the entire you know power like what we went through in the earlier you know the k-weighted filter and all of that and you end up with a value right now you remember i mentioned it is a sliding window yeah. what that means is the next block does not start at this point Overlap, the next absolutely. block actually yeah. overlaps this and the the standards uh, mention that it has to overlap by 75 percent so, you know, for 400 milliseconds, it means like, you know, it's simple, just take the next measure 100 milliseconds down the line. So the overlap is like, you know, if you divide this by four, you have three blocks, 300 yeah. milliseconds. Overlap. So all of these values that you finally get from here is the momentary value. Okay. This is what you see on the M value on the meter. Yeah. Now, that's clear, that's, that's fine and interesting. Now it comes to the second stage. We need to find a way to you know, exclude silences and all of that. So like I said, there are two gates that are there. Now the first one is called an absolute gating. So what an absolute gating means is in this case, you, know, you see these values 23 minus 22, minus 72, minus 42, et cetera. So an absolute gate is any value below minus 70 will be discarded. Yeah. You're not going to look so at that. It basically it makes no sense. Yeah. And it makes no sense. Right. So you, it goes through that. And so in this case, we discard minus 72 and an average as this goes on, you know, you get, you keep getting an average. So let's say in this case, our average is minus 25, for example. Now you remember the second gate is minus 10 LU. So anything that is 10 LU below that will be discarded. Right. Yeah. So in this case, if your average is minus 25, you know, you know 10 LU below that would be minus 35. Okay. So from this, any value below minus 35 will be discarded. So, you know, you're not going to look at minus 42, minus 40 and all of that. You know, you're going to yeah. skip those. And these values that you finally get are going to be averaged out. And this is your integrated value. This is your integrated loudness value at yes. the momentary. Yeah. Yeah. So the integrated value actually comes in from the momentary value. 
Okay. So, and it's 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 very interesting because at this point there are very clear methods of you know skipping the loudness, skipping the silent portions, and you know you make a good use of momentary value as well. So, um, and short term is basically measured exactly the same way as momentary is. You know, it's just that instead of four hundred milliseconds, say it is three seconds. And um, instead of, uh, you know, like a, a 300 milliseconds overlap, the overlap is 2.9 milliseconds. Yeah. But key thing to note is momentary is not gated. You know, you'll see all the values come up in momentary. It'll be whatever, if it's low, if it's high, you'll see all of that. The integrated value is gated. Okay. Like you have so when we're looking at our meters, we're seeing our momentary and our short term, they're, they're spinning around really quickly and changing mm. really quickly. But the, but the, the integrated loudness is over a longer, is, is take is gated so yes, yes. and it averages out well. yeah as well yeah. um so i mean if integrated loudness is found from momentary then why are we looking at short term right isn't it just much more stuff to measure well there's a very interesting reason why you have short term uh, measurement and the short term measurement is actually what is used for loudness range now okay. i told i mentioned earlier that the loudness range is, is different from dynamic range dynamic range is between the highest peak and you know whatever the lowest measure that you want to measure yeah the loudness range is slightly different it is a statistical value so what it does is it does not look at the very high peak and it does not look at the very low end so it gives you a real world measure of your loudness range as well and the way this okay. is done is so you know you have all of these short term values right so the short term values, let's imagine that they are stacked, you know, one after the other. So you have, okay, we've had uh, this, 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 this value. And then if you so look at the, it- So there's the LUFS value at the bottom and the number of yes. times that that value occurs up the side. Okay. Exactly, exactly. So you get kind of like a distribution curve or like a density curve or whatever you want to call it. So it's basically just stacking these and seeing how many times this comes up. And let's say this is your program uh, loudness uh, in this case. So the, the first step again is, you know, you discard anything below minus 70 LU because it makes no, no sense, you know, right? That's too low. And here's a slight change from the way uh, integrated loudness is measured. So integrated loudness, you measure minus 10 from your average, right? But for short term, you measure minus 20 below your average because you want to get a proper dynamic range. Because yeah. you, you shouldn't feel like, you know, your dynamic range is too less or it's too compressed and, you know, things like that. So minus 20 is where you kind of look at it from. So anything that is below minus 20 is discarded in this. And the way the loudness range is measured is it is the difference between the top 5% value and yeah. the bottom 10% value. So it's okay. like between 95% and 10%. So if you have like, like a huge snare that you know, just suddenly comes in, it's not going to affect your dynamic range. It's not going to affect your loudness range. Because that's now, outside of the kind of the main body that we're measuring. So we, we, allow, we allow a little, a little transient yeah. to pass through without affecting the, the range. Yes, and it. that's the beauty, isn't it? Because transients is what defines your mix as to be clean. Right? Yep. You know, you, you feel the finer details of that. Um, so this is a statistical distribution and this kind of gives you a ballpark measure of where it is. Now, the one thing to keep in mind is um, loudness range takes some time to settle down. It's not instantaneous because yep. it has to map out all these values. So it takes some time for it to be stable. And this is so, why it's- so sh Sorry, just let me, I didn't mean to interrupt. But so Basically, the importance of loudness ranges, if I understand this properly, is in my world, I'm mixing a concert. I want it to be really dynamic. Some of the bands I'm mixing at have, you know, have a really dynamic range. But if you broadcast, if you're sending this audio out to just a little mobile phone or something like that, um, or, or to a broadcaster, you, you, yeah. you want to kind of pull the mix together. You don't want the quiet stuff to be so, so quiet that it sounds like it's silent or the loud yeah. stuff to be yeah. so loud that it's yeah. clipping. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you, you and I have done this, right? So if you're watching a movie and, you know, you set your com remote level to your comfortable dialogue level and suddenly there's an explosion, you scramble for yeah. the remote and bring it down again. So that's the dynamic range. Um, so but, that's a typical back lounge thing where you're watching a movie in the back lounge and you, you're turning it up to hear the, 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 the dialogue and then the sound effects kick in and they're just crazy loud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but... Just, just one thing to keep in mind is, you know, over here we're talking about music and music is very artistic. It's very expressionist as well. So if, if your music requires a certain dynamic range, let it go. 
don't be too held up on that uh, because the loudness range or the dynamic range also completely depends on the genre of music that you have right i mean like sure. if you're playing edm or, or rock versus if you're looking at orchestral the dynamics yeah. are completely different but it's also good to keep it within a specific range so that you know when if you're listening it to on a mobile phone or something of that sort because our homes are not really um, uh, controlled environments right you have a lot yeah. of ambient noise in the home so if you go really low you might miss out some of the finer details of that so the loudness range actually helps you out um, with that as well so this is what you get so from this what you can understand is it is averaging out, isn't it? So it's a complete average across time. It is averaging out. It depends on frequencies and it depends on how low and how high you go. So yeah. it's basically telling you like when you mix, just look at the spectrum and look at how long you're hitting that, that portion as well. And that's very, very useful because it's so beautiful that it has actually taken something that was very subjective from person to person. You now have a way you can actually understand that with values. So if, if whatever we saw, if I, if I draw a simple line diagram of how this is, so you have the audio out of your console going out, yep. then you have the K filter, which is basically the way we listen to it. And you know, the, the audio from that, filter. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the, the human weighted filter. And then the audio from that, you know, now it's passed through the filter. So it's, it's a weighted audio yep. and this is split into two. So okay. one part goes to measure the momentary loudness every 400 milliseconds. And the other part goes to measure the short term loudness, you know, every three seconds with overlapping with 2.9 um, yeah. milliseconds. So from those values, then you find the momentary, um, the loudness. And, you know, if you're, if you're mixing like multi-channel and all of that, all of those channel weightages are all added up in this. Yeah. And then the final result of that is your momentary value and your short term value. So this is how we see the M and S. Now continuing on, you know, then again from this, it looks to see is it more than minus 70 LU or not? If it is more than minus 70, fine, we'll continue. And this is where you have the, the first difference that I mentioned, you know. So for, with, from the momentary value, you look at, is it minus 10? Is it below minus 10 of the average? Or yeah. is, sorry, is it above minus 10 of the average? And for the, in the short term, you look at if it is minus 20, above minus 20 of the average. So from there, you, if it is yes, if it is, let's say we agree with that. On the top one, we average over the time pe of the whole time period. And on the bottom one, we find the difference between the top five and the bottom 10. And yeah. that is how you get the integrated loudness and the loudness range. Got it. So it's, it's, it's so actually, it, it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah, you, you're saying something wrong? No, I was just going to say, these are the four values that you, you typically will see on, on, on a meter. Uh, if and a broadcaster and, and yeah, nowadays we can see them on plugins and stuff yeah and uh yeah that's that's such a great diagram to understand how we derive those values yeah, it, it's, it's it's so beautiful right you have the whole effect of you listening to something and this is also what is very interesting about this is you know like there have been questions like okay youtube has this value um you know spotify has a different value facebook has a different value do i need to you know provide different values when I'm mixing, how do I do that? You need to just be in the ballpark of what these are, you know, not too low, not too high, because some of these um, streaming uh, services will actually, if it's too high, it'll bring it down. Yeah. If it's too low, it'll bring it up. So you just need to be in the ballpark. Don't get completely stressed out about, you know, is it like way off and things like that. Yeah, but but on the other hand, we want to make sure, you know, we're, we're sound engineers. We, we want to be in control of everything. So we want to make sure that any changes that are being made are, are being made by us and not, not further upstream so that we need to, True. or just further True. downstream, in fact, so that we need to make sure that we, we're not so far away from these values that, that we're, we're being heavily limited or our content is too quiet, right? True, true. Yeah, absolutely. Because now you mentioned the word upstream because that is something that we also, sometimes we, we, we don't look at that fact because when you give something upstream, they're not really listening to the wave files at that point. It's always being converted to something else, right? It's either MP3 or AAC or Opus. So there is always a codec that is involved yeah. in that. And so, I mean, I remember, is, yeah, for years I've been in TV studios mixing the band I'm on tour with and, you know, listen to it on great you know studio monitors and then maybe it's, it's broadcasting next day and i listen to it and i go wow that's that's not what i mixed and that's because it's hit some 
limb or somewhere along the way and it's just smashed my my mix to bits so this is this is great this is a great way to make sure that you know we, we yeah. understand from here on and that's also and that's also why like you said rob you know when you when you look at the limiters that's also why the concept of true peak is is very useful to understand you know that's why it's not sample peak and it's true peak so okay, the easiest way to to talk about true peak is I, I don't want to do it through a presentation with, with slides, you know, let's look at it. Um, so this is um, from our good friends, Isotope. This is RX7. Um, yeah. I use this a lot because it's really good in waveform analysis and, and things like that as well. So if you, so I'll explain what you're looking at here. So you're looking at a waveform at a sample rate of 48 kilohertz. And this is a, a 12 kilohertz sine wave. And the reason I chose a 12 kilohertz is because that's one fourth of 48. So you have exactly four points yeah, per cycle. Four yeah. yeah. And the way this waveform is, is designed is like, you know, your sample peak is minus one. So none of the points of sampling are above minus one. So this will never indicate a red light on your console anywhere. Yeah. Right. But there is something that is very interesting that happens as well. So if I move the sample up, if I move the sample down, I move the next sample up, and if I move this next sample down, you can see what is happening. My sample peak is still minus one. Oh, your but true peak. there are peaks in between this that is happening. Do you so see that? that? Basically, and, yeah, so basically what you're saying is because I'm only sampling at 48K, uh, that there's, there's room for there to be peaks in between my sampling, so they're blind to, to my analysis. Exactly, and yeah. the way this is is these these peaks appear between the samples, so which means they're also higher frequencies, right? They're not within the frequencies that you're playing back at. Yeah. And uh, so, like I said, this is 48 kilohertz, and you can see like the true peak is around plus three and a half dBs. There are examples you know extreme examples um where you can actually you know technically push it up to 12 dbs above zero as well so here's a very interesting thing if i if i were to um up sample this to let's say 192 kilohertz yeah. at this point you will see that these values are pretty similar yeah you see that and that's because now you have sample points to measure that so if like all of our desks, right, they work at 96 kilohertz. So which means yeah. like you are able to see on the desk, you are able to see at least the intersample peaks. And these are called intersample peaks because this peak happens in between two samples, you know, intersample. Yeah. So that's why they call the ISL, um, uh, sorry, the, um, the intersample peaks. So a good way of understanding how this works, or uh, measuring how this works is to upsample the signal and then you right. get the peaks. So okay. why so are, like, why so, we, okay, so like, uh, um, got it. So like a true peak limiter, it, it up samples within the limiter to measure and then, and then kind of down samples. Yeah. Got, got it. Yeah. So Very why cool. are we so concerned about true peak? Because I also spoke about the fact that, you know, there is also a codec that we should um, be very concerned. We should we should understand about the fact that it's going to be converted into something else. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, this is a pretty uh, pretty good example of that as well. So this is just white noise. And again, the examples that I'm showing in this are extreme examples, you know. It, it may not necessarily be this extreme in, in terms of your music or your, your production, but you can always use your music and experiment with that just to see that. But, but, it, but it's good to know the, the possible places where we can... Yes, we can it's good to see issues. how... How, yeah. how wide it can go. So this is just white noise. And as you can see, my sample peak is minus 10. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to export this um, as MP3. Um, um, we can either choose to do 320, but you know, just, just to see how extreme we can go. Let's just keep it to, uh, for example, 128 kbps, you know, just so, the lowest, so very low, lowest. Low bit rate. Yeah. yeah, low bit rate. And this is white noise. And let's say I export this and I save that. And I re-import this back. You can see the difference that has happened. So my wow. sample peak that was minus 10 here yeah. is now minus 0.21. That's a 10 dB rise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, of course, this is an extreme example because when you convert something into an MP3, you know, it doesn't work well with random signals and, you know, white noise is completely random signals. Yeah. But you have chances of even your music peaking up. 
right? And this is something you need to be concerned about. That is why when you deliver to a streaming platform, they, you know, you, you are advised to keep it at least give it a DB, like minus one true peak, minus 1.5 true peak, so that you can account for the conversion right. that happens. Because if you, in the conversion to the codec that the streamer uses, you might, as you've seen here, um, yeah. actually change the peak levels and, and that could, and you know, in the worst case scenario, you could get some distortion or some clipping, right? Yeah, and what this also shows you is, it is not the true peak that is actually clipping. It is the, the sample peak itself, which is going up. Yeah. So, yeah. so where would true peak come in? And you know, this is, this is another very interesting thing um, to understand as well, because let's say um, if I limit my mixes like extremely high, well, I would end up getting, you know, square waves at some point, right? Yeah. If I'm, yeah. let's say if I'm, if I don't care about what I'm mixing or, you know, I'm completely bored or, you know, maybe I'm tired, you know, I, let's say I just limit the. Yeah. Limit. Or you've just got your gain structure all wrong, right? So this is, this is, this could be a function of gain structure as well, couldn't it? Yeah. You, if you get be. your gain structure wrong, you can end, have some square wave in your mix. Yeah. So um, in, in this case, what we are looking at is, um, is a square wave of hundred Hertz. Um, and this is a very, very simple thing that I'm going to show you. Again, look at the sample peak. It is minus 12 dBs, um, way below. And, you know, when you send out your signal after the DA conversion, you know, you know, there, there can be uh, instances where some of your electronics, you know, even if it's just your monitor controller or something like that, they may have DC offset removals or something, which is basically like filtering out the very low frequencies in yeah. that. So, you know, as an example, if I were to just filter the very low frequencies, like 20 Hertz, uh, and if I just do that, my peak has gone up yeah, from crazy. minus 12, it's gone to minus 6.83. And this is at 20 Hertz. This is like way, way, way down. And we're still peaking. So this is another thing that can happen at the very end of converter stages. So when you're mixing, it's, and this can happen on both ends, not just the low end, even on the high frequency level as well, you can have these clips happen. So this is a very good example of you know, why you should be very concerned. You should, you, sh you should have a good gain structure and not limit completely because square waves are not good. And this is also where, you know, intersample peaks make a lot of difference as well. Yeah. So and it's also good to give a little bit of space for, to, to allow these things to happen, to allow the codex to happen. To allow yeah. Them. Because what are we, I mean, at the end of the day, what are we trying to do? We are trying to give out a mix that sounds really good. The audience does not really care about all of these technical bits. They just want it to sound good, right? But as an engineer, you want to know what's, what's the best thing you can do to make it sound good. But these are little traps that we need to be aware of, aren't they? These are little traps yeah. that we need to think about when we're putting together our mix for yeah. our, our, our broadcaster or, or for streaming. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, again, I, I, have, I keep repeating this because these are extreme examples just to show you how extreme it can go. But even if it's not this extreme, it may or may not happen in your, in your mix as well. But it's a good thing to, you know, just keep in mind if in case you, you limit too hard or you work the limiter too hard as well. Yeah, because, for example, these are all little mistakes you can make. Like, for example, if your mix has got too much high mid in it, I would say. So that's yeah. gonna that's gonna show up on your loves as, as as kind of hot, and then the limiter is gonna be applied, and then as you showed with that curve, what's gonna happen is you're gonna actually because the the because your mix is low, you're gonna not get as much low end. So just by having just a little bit too much high mid in your mix, the the end result can be kind of you can doubly lose the the bottom end on your mix, right? And it sounds like yeah, just, yeah. your mix yeah. is going I through mean, a telephone. Yeah. Like you said, you know, if you if you remember the equal loudness contour at, at lower volumes, we're not susceptible, we're not responsive to low frequencies. So if it gets turned down, you just keep, yeah. like you said, you know, like a telephone mix. Well, we've I mean, all heard those mixes, right? And I'm sure it did something <laughs> like that to the person that was mixing in the studio. But we've all heard those mixes on, on live TV, a concert on live TV, where that, that, you know, it's a picture of the bass guitarist playing and you can't hear any bottom end. And all you can pretty much hear is the vocal because that's, that's where that kind of two to four key thing is going on. And, hmm. And uh, mm. yeah, yeah, that's just one of the things that we need to think about, right? When we're when we're putting our mixes together for yeah. and for, for streaming. The good thing is when you see this wish, when you see this visually happen, you know, it it just opens up your mind. Like you know, there's there's a lot of these things that are happening down the chain, yeah. right? Which we which we never you know thought about. So. If you look at the way that True Peak was actually done, you know, in the earlier one, so we have the input that comes in. Uh, yeah. It's dropped by 12 dBs so that, you know, we know, like I said, it can go up to 12 dBs high. So it's dropped by 12 dBs first, 
it's over sampled four times. So at 48K, it would be um, 192 kilohertz, but at 96K, they still stick to 192. 192 it, really two times. Yeah. it won't go crazily high. And you know, then you have a filter, which is basically like a, a reconstruction filter that happens there for the, for the oh sorry, the oversampling filter. So that you know, it takes care of all of those uh, things as well as you oversample. And this is also where you know sometimes uh, these meters may vary slightly between them. Like um, like a meter from one company and the meter from the other company may have slight variations, like 0.3 to 0.5 dBs of variation that can happen because of the way they each each one of them implements the um, the upsampling mechanism. Yeah. And this filter was actually what was, in, you know, this value of the filters was what was said in 1770-3 in the ITU spec. And then from this, you see the, uh, the absolute and the peak after it's normalized back to, so the, the minus 12, and then after you get the values, you know, they add plus 12 so that you get the signal, and then you get the, the peak and the, the, the running values as well. Okay. So this is how true peak is measured. And this is very interesting because now we've seen um, what happens with the codex. Now we've seen how what the LUFS tells you, and now we've seen what true peak is, and all of those things. And this is a really good chart that has been compiled by um, by a really good mastering engineer named Ian Stewart. Uh, a shout out to Ian as well. Um, so this is like the different specifications you have if you're streaming to YouTube or Spotify, or if you're sending your mix to Amazon. You know, so for example, if you look at, like like if you look at YouTube. So YouTube requires um, uh, their loudness is minus 14. So which means what it does is, um, uh, if, if your level crosses minus 14, it's going to bring it down. And we all saw that, you know, the value is just dBs, right? So if it is, let's say you're, if YouTube requires minus 14 and you're sending minus 10, it's just going to come down by four dBs. It's like turning down the gain by four dBs. Yeah. Um, that's because, and it does not increase the level. That's something to keep in mind. So, if, so if, you're, if you're over the limit, it's, it's going to bring you down in a way that you have no control over. And if you're under the limit, it's not going to bring you up to, to no. audible. If, you, if you're way low, then, then, then your mix is going to be way quiet, right? Yes, yes. And uh, YouTube doesn't do that in a way because, you know, if you bring it up, then you also have to consider limiting, you know, because yeah. you may have uh, uh, you know, occasional transients that come and you may have to consider limiting and all of that. So it doesn't do any of that. It just brings it down if it's way above that. And now you can understand because one of the things that took me some time to understand is the relationship between something that is minus 14 and how does it sound to me? Yeah. You know, what is this in terms of SPL, right? Like if, if you say this is minus 14, fine, but what am I listening to? So when I first um, started mixing for, for, for these deliverables, um, what I did, this is, this is a trick that any one of you can do. This is basically how I made myself um, get used to this, is um, I had to deliver minus 23 um, uh, LKFS. And I had a mix that was minus 23 LKFS, and I played it back in my studio where, I'm, or where I work. And then I turn up the monitoring level to, or turn it down to something that I feel is comfortable. Because yeah. like I said, Rob, loudness is very subjective. What sure. uh, the loudness that you but, are comfortable But the LUFS is, is not the volume that you're listening to, is it? That's you know, no. that's that's you can control that with your headphone amplifier or whatever it is you want. That's yes, you know. So uh, the way I figure this out is let's say I'm mixing something and I have to deliver at minus twenty three, but whenever I mix, you know, my mix is becoming minus twenty. Which yeah. means I just have to turn uh, turn up my um monitor level by three dBs. It's because I feel I'm hearing low and that's why I keep pushing levels. So if I turn it up by three dBs, my mixes are going to be minus 23. So it's all about getting used to this. And you know, there is a, there is a very interesting thing um, as well. So if you, there is a European body called um, Senelec. Uh, there are variations that are happening to this as we speak. So one of the things that Senelec has for the, for the mobile devices is, um, or the, um, the, um, the personal music players is that they have a test tone, um, which roughly is minus 10 uh, uh, LKFS. And what they say is when you play this test tone in your mobile phone and you put the mobile phone to the maximum volume, the output of the mobile phone should not exceed 100 uh, dB SPLA weighted. So when Cause that's if, loud, cause that's gonna, you know, that's, that's <laughs> that loud. loud. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and in your headphones. 
Yeah, exactly. and if if um, I mean, of course, music is not um, not like a test tone. It does not have the signature of the test tone. But even if you if you are assuming that something that is very close, and if it's minus fourteen, it's still four dB less. That's still nine to six dB SPF. You yeah. can hit at maximum volume. So when you when you consider these these values, these and there are talks of you know changing this, you know taking off the limiter and then putting like a warning like a dosimeter on on the mobile phones and all of that with send like. But this is how you relate to this um, in 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 terms of what you're delivering because every person will perceive minus fourteen differently. Yeah, I may be comfortable with the volume that I'm listening at, but I may you may want to turn it up or turn it down. So when you are mixing and you have like you're in the concert and you just quickly put on your headphones to see how it is, you know, you, you, as you do your virtual sound check, I would think you can set those levels as well to something that you're comfortable with, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And this is something we've discussed in the past, isn't it? If, I, if I'm mixing, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing in a concert hall. Um, I'm in control of the way that the audience receives that audio, how, how, how it's weighted in terms of the bottom end, the sub, the high end, the level it's at, the dynamic range that it has. Um, and that's one of the joys for me of, of mixing live sound as composed to mixing you know, records. You mix an album, you throw it out into the world and people listen to it in all different kinds of ways with different uh, qualities of speakers or headphones, different levels. So you have no actual control over it. So we still have no control over the level that people are going to listen to to our broadcast on. But what we can do is make sure that we're agreeing with the broadcaster or the streamer, the kind of area that the mix should should occupy. Is that right? Is that where we are? Right. Yes. That? Yeah. And that's also interesting because uh, one key thing to to understand is also you can see there are different values like there's minus 14, minus 16, minus 15. You can just be in the ballpark. Like even if you let's say you deliver at um, uh, minus 13, YouTube is going to drop yeah. it by one dB and it's not, I don't know, but I personally haven't felt that much of a difference, like dropping off of one dB on, on, on something that's streaming, you know, that doesn't yeah. really impact us. So you can be in the ballpark in this. The only thing you need to keep in mind is if you're delivering for a broadcaster, then you have yeah. to hit the spec, yeah. right? If they say minus 23, they will tell you, okay, minus 23 plus or minus one dB or plus or minus 0.5 dB. And that is when you need to, there are some techniques that you can actually use, um, which is actually, you, it's, it's, it's logical from the way we measure loudness. And these are some of the tricks that I use, some of the techniques that I use. Um, and there are multiple ways you can do this. Um, but you know, none of this is like written in stone. These are just ideas that you can start off okay. as well. So listen, I've got a bit of music playing here on my Pro Tools rig through my desk. And uh, All right. we discussed this and I've chucked a couple of plugins on it. So maybe we can actually look at this rather than talk about it. Sure, so sure, let's do go. that. I'm going to share my screen. So now you should hopefully be seeing my mixing desk. There we are. So there's my, there's the meter. So that's the last thing on the chain that I have on, on, on the right. content. And so talk us through this meter and I'm not doing very well at the moment. This is for broadcast we're talking about. We're looking to get a kind of minus 24 right. LDFS on this, right? LKFS, so let's say sorry. you you want to uh, hit uh, minus twenty four LKFS. Uh, again, you know that LKFS LUFS. You don't have to be worried about the differences in that. So what you're looking at is the WLM, uh, which is from Waves, um, and you can actually see there are on the three big blocks over there, three big squares. You can see there's a short term, which yeah. we know is averaged over three seconds. There is a long term, which is like from when you start to when you stop, and there is a range, which is the uh, the loudness range that we just spoke about. Got it. Now, Below that, you can see there is a momentary value and also the true peak indicators, like in, in the bars that you see. Now, um, a quick thing, and this is you're on EBU, which means um, it's, you can see that, that the method is EBU and it's highlighted in red. That's why on the right side, you know, the short term is, is locked. You can't change the value. It is three, deep, uh, three seconds, which yeah. is fixed. And on the very it's bottom, painted. on the left side, you can see it is weighted to ITU 1770. So you have that one as well. Yeah. Fine. So this is how the, and we understand, now we understand all of these things. I think None so. I hope so. I think I'm, I, just from what you've explained to me today, this is the first time I've looked at this meter and really kind of grasped it. So the first thing we need to, okay, what's the first thing we need to do? We need to bring the level down, right? Because we're too hot. Yeah, but you're also peaking. I'm also peaking. Okay. So peaks first. That's the one yeah, that's going to get me the most the trouble. Peaks. Yeah. So, so I, at your uh, recommendation... I added uh, this plugin, 
which is the uh, the Nugent ISL True Peak Limiter. And this right. value here is what is going to control the peaks, right? Yes. So this is, you remember I mentioned in the beginning, like, you know, every peak meter has slight variations in, in the way they look at uh, the filters and all of that. They look at the peaks. So if you were to deliver, let's say for minus one true peak, a good idea yeah. is to keep it at minus 1.5 or minus 1.3, but minus, yeah. let's go with minus 1.5. The default now. there was, was two and I, I, I took it down to minus 1.5 because we want to be like half a, half a dB beneath the, the minus one. Would that yeah. be a sensible yeah. place to go? That would be a yeah. sensible thing. You can right. also so, do this with the new gen or the pro limiter as well. You know, these are all fantastic limiters and true true peak limiter. That is the key. And there's a pro limiter, right? That comes with the desk. We could have used that one as well, but I just wanted to use a third party one. I'm going to put this in stream now. Yeah. So, so it's now in stream and I'm going to go back to the meter and I need to reset, don't I, to, to, to check my... Yes. So that so all of the meters are reset right now. There you go. And here's my true peak, which is the green, the green meter, and it's safe. Yeah, right? it's, I'm not, yeah, I'm it's not well within it. your, your peaks. You're not, you're not hitting the levels. Now, <clears throat> yeah, you can see it stopped at minus 1.5. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to bring the level down to get it more or less in the ballpark. Yes, so your delivery spec is minus 24, but you're hitting minus 18. So here's, here's something that I... Uh, do very often. So if if the spe if the value is like four or five dBs above what I need to deliver, the yeah. first thing I do is bring the gain down because that's the easiest yeah. thing. Because so I'm I'm just for everybody at home. I'm sending a matrix out to to the to the streaming service. Um, I've got just my left and right in that matrix, and what I've just done to pull this level down is I've just pulled the the, the left right send in that matrix down a little bit that's the the first in the stage of of kind of pulling this the, the idea is we're going to try and pull this mix together so it fits nicely and and in, in, in the the range that the broadcast has given us with it with a, uh, at the level that the broadcast has given us with a different decent loudness range right that's the yeah. plan so let's okay. I mean, uh, you can I'm still a little bit over but i want to be a little bit over because there's there's other ways i can control this right Shri? because like we talked about yeah. this before we can go well maybe because of the way that the the, the, the frequencies are measured maybe we need to pull the the high mids back a little bit uh, yeah to, if you want to tuck them down a bit right so there's two ways i can do this um the first one is i can use this multiband compressor yeah um and i've, I've just opened the range here between 1k and 8K because 4K is the kind of peak, right? 4K is the kind yeah, of... Yeah, it peaks up at 4K. So I just and brought the threshold in of that just to, just to kind of just trim. I'm also just doing a little bit smoothing at the bottom end as well. Um, yeah, and that's, gonna... actually, that's actually a good thing because you remember when you bring down uh, the levels, you know, or your, your balance might change a little bit. So you can actually exactly. use this to smoothen out the bottom end. And the good thing is the bottom end is not being measured in the, um, in the measurement. Right. You have but, a, no, but if we pull down the top end relative to the bottom end, then our mix might get a little bit skewed. But we want to pull down the, yeah. the, the high mid here as it can have the, the unattractive frequencies and a high mid, the, the ones that we that we find harsh, um, yeah. just to just to get us within the ballpark. Yeah. So and just, just like like you said, Rob, it's just a tad. You know, you don't want to change the the tonality of the song. It's, it's just so that you're catching some of those. Yeah. It's just it's just a little finesse rather than just turning everything down because then that that might not you know it's, we've just literally turned everything down and if the high mids are still too high then because we brought it all down then we'll lose the low end at that point right yeah yes yeah. it's my understanding of what you've just told me so i've just brought in this uh multi-band and let's see what i was doing again that's getting us towards the area that we need to be should i reset that yeah yeah just just go ahead and reset that and you can see like if you if you give it some time, you'll see that this actually comes down into the into the area that you're looking for. And we yeah, want to hit a little, twenty four. Get a little tick in the short term. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do as well is is to show you this one. This is another way that I could have done the same thing. Is I could have just used, for example, this uh, this nice Sony Oxford Dynamic EQ. And what yeah. I've done is I've I've chosen the kind of the same kind of frequency range, right? Uh, yeah. With a nice deep one, and you can see occasionally it'll just drop that drop that high mid range down if I if I get a, a peak. At, at yeah, yeah, you, you can see it. It's just smoothening out the things. Smoothing it's, out that thing. Yeah. It's just like mastering, isn't it? So you just like kind of 
tucking down the ones that are poking out. I did and, a little session for Groove Armada recently. They went up onto a bunch of streaming platforms, and this was this was this this was the chain I had, and this was the the process I went through. Um, I'm not going to play any music because we can get into trouble with the streaming services. But this is you can see behind my shoulder. This is a, 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 a multi-track that I'm, I'm mixing. Um, right. So we're getting close, I reckon, Sri. Let's have a look. Yeah. Uh, yes, we're we're in we're getting closer all the time. Still got my, I've got to feel my mouth. Right. So it might be a touch loud. Um, and then the other thing is, I'd quite like to bring down my loudness range because I want to make sure this mix is nice and tight. I want to make sure that even if you listen to low volume, you're not losing some of the content. Right. Uh, and what's the simplest way to do that? I mean, it, because it's like a singer, right? If your singer's extremely wide, you put a compressor. Yeah. It's the same so, same technique. So here's a here's a here's the uh, the pro compressor by Avid. Oh, by the way, this is the order of of my inserts. Uh, the first one would have been the multiband. Uh, the second one is the compressor. The third one is the limiter, and then of course the fourth one would be the meter. So I can see what we've done to all of that stuff. So I've just I've just set this up in advance. I've just I've just tickling a little bit. You can see here of the of the compression. Um, up three four db of compression um i'm in smart mode why would i be in smart mode Shriek? so you, you have these different the you have different modes on the compressor the good thing about uh, the smart mode is it works across um, a wide kind of signals so if your program is like a mixed track it's a good idea to put it in a smart mode because the the detector circuit kind of uh, varies according to the input signal whereas rms means it look at the rms peak means it look at the peak and start to compress so if you're, if you're using it on a master bus, you know, putting it on the smart mode is pretty good. Cool. So listen, um, I'm going to put that in. I'm going to put that in line now. And I'm going to go back to our our metering. How are we doing? Yeah, we're getting close. Still a little bit hot. I brought my. I just need to reset that. I think, don't I? Yeah. And I think that should bring us pretty pretty damn close. Uh, bring the range down to more manageable amount. We're definitely not peaking anymore. These are just all the things that we should be checking, right? Yeah. And here's one thing. If I was listening, I, you know, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, well, it sounds pretty good, but I, maybe I've lost a few of the transients because of the, uh, because of the compression. So a, a lovely thing on this compressor that I use a lot is a, is a wet-dry mix. So I can actually just open up some of the dry signal so some of the uncompressed signal i can just sneak a bit of that back in just to bring back in some of those transients as i kind nice. of in the box parallel compression new york compression whatever you want to call it very a la mode um so here we go i'll just bring a little bit of the the dry mix back in come over here i think we've we've got pretty close to where we want to be right yeah and um, you're still um, you're already at the ballpark it's like a db off but remember like you are averaging out so you know you, this is just like you have to take into consideration your entire song as well yeah but if i'm looking at my momentary in my short term i i'm, I'm feeling pretty good about this I th yeah. i'm thinking i'm going to be uh pre pretty we did this very quickly obviously if if you're doing this uh in a virtual sound check you'll spend a lot of time i might even do this in a virtual sound check i might you know i might take each single song in the set if i know i'm going to be streaming it i'll take each single song in in the in a virtual sound check and i'll set the value for all of the plugins on on, on this chain and for the left right value into my matrix specifically for that song because if if i'm in an arena i don't care if there's a quiet song and then a loud song in fact i want that to happen right that's the curve of a show yeah, that's that's how you make a dynamic within a show. You don't start at eleven and keep it till eleven till the end. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some people and, do. But I don't. Th in my opinion, <laughs> that's not the best way to go to to to, to mix a show. Um, but um, what I do want to do is have that curve, but maybe not quite as exaggerated because I'm not controlling the way that it's being broadcast, mm. being listened to out in the world. So maybe I want to just make sure that each each song, um, within my show. It's, it's close, like you say, like your favorite phrase, in the ballpark. <laughs> yeah. Does that make, does that make sense? sense? Yes, yes. Because um, we're going to find out in a minute when we ask people at home for it, have they got any questions? So we're going to find out in a minute whether we're, we're making any sense at all. But yeah, but you, you've already hit, you know, hit the target. You know, you have the tick mark. Um, I've got a tick mark, okay. Slightly off, you know, but this is fine because this there may you be your 20, first minus song. Minus 24, minus and, 24, 
with a six six dB range. That would have, yeah. I, I'm pretty happy with that. That seems about and right to me. This is another thing that uh, so for for longer broadcast uh, mixes as well. It's like if if your delivery was like let's say uh, you have to deliver for minus twenty three, uh, try and start off a few dBs below that, just so that you have headroom for the climax to be yeah. you know big and you still hit the the final loudness. So and you know the good thing is when you're mixing with the band, you know the set list. You know, it, they may start off with a very, you know, good punchy track and in between they may have just like an acoustic guitar and the singer and then come back and yeah. things like that. So, and of course, with an acoustic guitar and a voice, you would expect the LU range to be much, much wider, right? So this, yeah. is, this, is, a, this is a band, this is drum kit and stuff. This, yeah. So I, I, would ex I, I would expect my range to be a smaller number, sing single digits like this. But if it's, you know, a, just an acoustic guitar and one voice, then you would you'd be happy if that that range was was wider yeah yeah and six is is like a good compression like six means it is it is compressed so one thing you might want to occasionally just put on your headphones and just see that it's not getting hyper compressed as well uh, but yeah. you would anyways do that during virtual sound check yeah i guess that i guess the important thing to stress on this is what's most important is is listening to this message is what the single thing that we haven't done on this this webinar um but because we're you know we had to be listening to the mix and the, the meters is just a guide. The meters is just an aid to us. Yes. We, we can't, but I, I'm quite happy to have them on. I'm quite happy to be glancing at my meter and just making sure every now and then, I mean, you know, my primary concern is the 30,000 people in the arena, but if, you know, as well as having to record the band on the Pro Tools or whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm streaming to, to the Tinter web, then I'll just be having a little glance at that to make sure I'm not. Yeah. The, the, the good thing about this is you're not tied down by the meter, right? And you want to be free as a mix engineer. You're, you're controlling the crowd as well, in a way. You're the artist yeah. as well, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, so that's one of the, one of the things, the responsibilities of Mix and Sound Live is, is you're the, you're the, the person that, that delivers the performance on stage to the audience. You're the interpretation of that. And, and part of that is, is, is volume is something that you and I just discussed before is, you know, the temptation in the quiet bits when the, if there's a, the crowd are a bit noisy is, is to turn the quiet bits up so they can hear it. But actually the brave thing to do is to, to keep the quiet bits quiet or even pull them down a little bit to make the crowd go quieter, you know, to make them lean forward and listen. Um, nice. Yeah, it's not something we can control in broadcasting. Yeah. Nice. So if I just want to, you know, if you, you, you take it back over and sum this all up for us, Right, take us home. Yeah, yeah. Maybe if you can just uh, unshare your screen, I can quickly oh, share. I thought, I, I thought you could just overshare, but there you go. All yours. So this is where we, um, this is exactly what you did, Rob. So you first look at the clips, you, you tucked in the peaks. If it was way above, like for a couple of four, four or five dBs above your target, you just brought down the entire gain. And when you brought down the entire game, you know, it still has headroom for your, you know, snares and attack and all of those transients to go through as well. Sure. And then, you know, you brought in, if it's too dynamic in terms of the loudness range or the peak to loudness ratio, the peak to loudness ratio is actually very easy to see. It's what you see on your true peak and what you see on the, um, on the integrated value. So, uh, you know, a, a logical way of looking at that is if, if you're delivering, let's say for YouTube, and um, you have a true peak of minus one and your loudness is minus 14, then your PLR is, is minus 13. Whereas uh, if it is too wide, so if, if, you're, if, if it's too narrow, for example, and loudness is really high, what's gonna happen is it's gonna drop it down and it's gonna yeah. bring down your peaks as well. So that's, you can use a compression for that, which is exactly what you did. And um, uh, another good thing to understand is what if it's below your target, right? So yeah. you can bring up the gain. And when you bring up the gain, just make sure, just keep an eye on the limiter just to make sure it's not working too hard or just so that, you know, it's, it's, it sounds good. At the end of the day, that's all everyone cares about is that it, it sounds good, isn't it? And yeah, I, that's, that's important. But I think some of the stuff we were talking about is, is places you can make a small mistake that gets amplified by this process. So having too yeah. much high mid in the mix will be amplified, you know, having any square wave at all will be amplified. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so but this is basically what we went through, right? So we yeah. understood exactly how the loudness is calculated. You know, you have the signal goes through exactly how you hear things. You average out the power. If you're doing multi-channel, you know, then you put the weightage in. It's converted into dBs. And then finally, you put a gate for the silence. And there you have it. You have a value that averages over time. 
And for true peak, it's basically you drop it down by 12 dBs, then you oversample it to 192K. Uh, you put your filters just for the oversampling part, and then you display those values after you normalize it back to uh, 12 dBs. And we figured out what the loudness range is. You know, it's like between the top um, uh, 5% and the bottom 10%, or like 95% to bottom 10% is your yeah. loudness range. And it's not too hard. It's it's actually very logical. This is exactly how we hear things. It's just that they put a number to it, you know, and once you it's, see the number. Yeah, it's a seriously complex little bit of maths to because human beings are complex, right? So you, to 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 put a value, to put us an equation that describes our response um, yeah. needs to be complex. And, and uh, but, but honestly, after you haven't explained that to me uh, for the last hour, I, I honestly feel like I'm, I'm better in control of it. I mean, I hate to think of some of the stuff I've done before I knew all of this. I've, I've just chucked mixes out of there onto YouTube. <laughs> well, fingers crossed, that's... hoping for the best, you know? <laughs> so now, now, now I've got a better understanding of how to actually control that. And uh, yeah. thanks so much for that, Sri. No worries, man. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's good to see that uh, and all of us, because a lot of people have also invested a lot of time because this is, in a way, quite mystifying, right? I mean, if you don't get your head around this, and it's actually quite logical once you yeah. think about it. It's yeah. easy and, to go uh, kind of blind when you see that equation into the single world. I don't... <laughs> Who splits the where's, bill? Where's, where's the nearest <laughs> bar? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Chris Lambrex, are you still out there? Are you still awake? I am. Uh, <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is the Q and A part of of the session. Um, what, yeah. You know, um, yeah. Have people I, been I think, firing uh, in Q, Q questions? I, I think we have a, a couple of questions left. But I mean, I mean I'm, I'm just going to try to condense these. Right. First off, Sri, there's a lot of thank yous in. Uh, the Q&A saying like, look, excellent content. This is really great. So I think people are appreciating this. Uh, so oh, man, thanks for, for doing this. Yeah, for thanks for right taking now. the time out to come yeah. and explain that to roadies, all that kind of clever <laughs> broadcast stuff for roadies. That's, yeah. that's and, and thanks that to all said, of them uh, for actually spending the time to sit and go through this, right? They've invested one hour of their time, which is huge. <laughs> that being said, uh, the, the webinar seems to be well attended by, you know, people who I think are, are more into maybe even film mixing and surround and, and, and stuff okay. like that. But yeah, you know, just let's, let's do a quick round of easy questions first and then a couple of interesting ones. So Sri, uh, does dither uh, affect LRA and loudness? So one of the ways that dither actually comes into play is when you um, uh, put in, like when you actually go from 24 bit to 16 bit or something like that. It's, it's basically uh, to cover for quantization noise. And to be honest, that, that level is way too low. You know, you're talking about like what, minus 120 dBs, minus 130 dBs, et cetera. So that does not affect um, uh, in the LRA at all. So even if you dither, you know, that's way too low. Because if you look at the LRA, you remember, the first thing that was removed was anything below minus 70 is, is skipped. So dither does not affect. But the one place where you can't get away from that is probably when you convert it to a lossy codec like MP3 or AAC or Opus, um, you have a quantization noise that comes in. And that's why these different converters, you know, they have limiters and uh, some of the converters actually have a very good implementation of those, um, uh, of those conversion methods as well. So yeah, Dither does not, in my opinion, at least to my understanding, does not affect uh, the LRA. So lossy codec is a codec that engenders loss as for, what's the opposite yeah. of a lossy one? Lossless. So you'd be a loss fool or a lossless. I, it's, I find the word <laughs> lossy crazy. It's like, I don't know. I, I, when you first said, mentioned lossy to me, I thought you meant like in a legion of sound engineers or something. I thought it was some a ghost <laughs> body I'd never heard of. But, uh, it's L-O-S-S-Y. Okay. -O -S -S <laughs> next, <laughs> next question, actually, about the codex. There's, I thought this was an interesting one as well. Um, there's codec emulation plugins, you know, codec mm. plugins that emulate an MP3, et cetera, et cetera. Or on the mastering side or the studio world, but is that has do those have any relevance, any use for for? Yeah, absolutely. There? So, 
like Nugent, for example, like Nugent has this plugin called Master Check, um, which uh, can actually show you how it would sound if you were playing it through YouTube or iTunes or things like that. So it gives you a, like a fair understanding of how it might sound when it passes through the codec. And you might want to give that a listen because one of the things that I've noticed, for example, is if you use a lot of wideners, um, this is again, this is something that's kind of a personal experience of mine. If you use a lot of whiteners and once it goes through the codec, you know, you kind of lose the, the imaging of that. You know, it doesn't either, it sounds too wide or too, uh, you know, you choose, you, you lose the positioning of that. And another very interesting thing is if you use a lot of wideners, your, your loudness value seems to go up uh, as well. Um, so in a, coming back to codecs, yes, I mean, they would give you an, uh, an estimate of how it sounds through that. But remember, all of these codecs have to deal um, with music that is streaming in because you're inserting that. It's not like you've taken the file and converted that. You're listening through that. So there, it may change between plugins, but it's not that varied. And um, there's, a, there's a lovely website called loudnesspenalty.com um, as well. Where if you have your mix, you can just um, you can upload the wave file and it'll tell you how much it'll get dropped by for YouTube or Spotify or iTunes. Or etc. That's a good um, website to check out as well. What did you say? Loudness finality. Penalty. Penalty. P e n a l t y. Ah, loudness penalty. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's a cool one. Um, cool. Good. Right, to know. Rob. Uh, one for you. Um, Hope it's easier than last time. A couple of people on here who have seen your mix, uh, Massive Attack show, and who mentioned, okay. like, well, that's a really dynamic show. Uh, I think you actually answered it at some point in, in the webinar, but maybe readdress it. Would you do anything different if you were to you know, stream the, a show like that live versus yeah, yeah, you know, getting yeah, it out I, of the I, I did touch on it, but like yeah, I, yeah, I, I, one hundred percent. So I, I did touch on it, and, and, it, and it's, it's that one, isn't it? It's the difference. It's the difference in the way that you listen to something. So, like I said before. In, in, in a concert environment, you're completely in control, or you should be in completely in control, right? You should be completely in control of the way that the audience listens to the mix in terms of the dynamic range. And I'm a huge fan of, you know, I'm lucky in the, the, the bands that I work with most recently have, have a great understanding of the way dynamics affects an audience emotionally and uh, dynamics affects the, the way that we they perceive sound, right? Um, something's only loud because before it's been quiet. And we, actually, we talked about this last week, two weeks ago with the, the theater sound designers, right? Um, but of course, e even back in the day when I was mixing on, I don't know, Jules Holland or Saturday Night Live or something, you turn, you're on tour, you're mixing a certain level, certain dynamic range, and then you get into a TV studio. If you take that attitude with you and then you listen back of somebody's TV, then of course, you, the, if, if the dynamic range is as extreme as it is in, in a concert sound, then you lose a lot of stuff. Either you lose the, the, the volume, you lose the top, or you lose the, the quiet stuff. So, yeah, I've always been aware when I've been mixing for broadcasting, for streaming, that you have to be aware of the, the change in the way that people listen to the music. Yeah. People don't have big stacks of subs in their living room when they're listening <laughs> to your mix in the same way that we might have in, in an arena. But cool question. Yeah, dynamics. I can talk about dynamics all day long. I love the dynamics. Excellent. Okay. A um, couple of people, so I, I'm going to try to formulate it, the, the next one into you know, what, what I think people are asking for here. Um, first off, uh, loudness, or loudness, is, loudness versus SPL and the metering, how you, how you meter loudness and how you meter SPL, which is in an acoustic environment. And then you know, and I, I think you've touched on this as well, but is, is, there, is there any tool out there which would correlate this? I think at some point you mentioned something about 1K tone being sent out of a phone, but is there, is there some kind of tool which would be you know, easier or relevant for us measuring-wise, which would bring you know, what you're going to measure for loudness and for, for your streaming platform, as opposed to what you know, the acoustic environment is measuring in terms of SPL? Uh, that's actually a, a good question. Um, I'm not aware of anything that directly correlates loudness with SPL, because remember when you're when you're streaming loud when you're streaming something to a certain loudness value, uh, you are streaming it in a way that it sounds good across different devices. And when you're listening to this, you know you can set whatever volume you want at home or you know wherever else because that's the volume that you're accustomed to. Um, 
if if I keep if I have like if I spend a lot of money and if I have a, like a home theater system or like I have really good speakers, I may turn up the volume compared to you know what I would do at home or you know on my headphones. So, but there is a body like I said called Senelec, um, which kind of uh, kind of mentions a relationship between um, the loudness and the maximum SPL that it can give through a portable music player. Uh, so Senelec has is is a body, and I I think it is it is kind of only a European um, thing for now, um, but uh, you can read a lot about it on on their website as well on on the standards as well. So if you remember, you know, if you increase the volume on your phones, it'll tell you that you know there's a warning that comes in. This is too loud, kind of a thing. It's like a dosimeter. So yeah, there are organizations that look into that, but a direct relation between LUFS and SPL is something that each person, kind, I think each person needs to get used to. Yeah. Um, it's like I said, I turn up the monitor for me for minus 23. It's a human response thing, isn't it? It's, it's not. Yeah, but that is That's my- the difference between the two. Yeah. yeah. That's my understanding of, uh, of that. Right, I, I think uh, looking at the clock, I think we have time for maybe two more. Um, uh, here's an interesting one. What's the worst? What's the worst thing that can happen if I just ignore all of this? You get fired. <laughs> That's the worst thing that can happen. It's the the bad manager sitting at home watching this on the telly, going, "This is shocking." <laughs> get, get, get rid of that fella. Uh, but, you know, like like we've seen. You know, <laughs> although the examples that I showed were slightly extreme, but all of those things can happen. You know, if you have square waves, if you're not looking at your peaks, you know, they would distort. If you're way off the charts, or if you're too quiet, you know, there's another thing. If you're too loud and it gets turned down, you would actually sound much quieter. You know, all of your dynamics would be lost. All of your, uh, it would sound crushed because then there's nothing that is masking the frequencies when it was loud, right? And then you bring it down, then all of those masks, masks are taken off. So your, your mix would actually sound a bit um, off. But that being said, uh, with with a lot of work and with a lot of experience, you would notice that your mixes tend to generally be in this ballpark. You don't have to put in a lot of effort to to get to this part. I mean, like you were seeing Rob, right? Rob, what it was just like a couple of minutes that you did um, in this. Uh, although it was like you would do it this this per song, but you notice that it's not too much of an effort once you understand how it is as well. So it's basically like the consistency of your mix. That is your mix. That is your song. And you have to stick to that. How you get to the level with that, with slight tweaks, is just what we showed here. I think I think that's exactly it. I think you need to be confident in your own mix. You be confident in the way that you've distributed the frequencies and and the levels across your mix, the dynamics of your mix, and then and then uh, and then tweak from there. We're not saying that this is how you should mix. This is just examples of the kind of things that you might want to do. The kind of things that you need to be aware of, if if you spent like me, you know, 40 years of your life mixing in gigs and now all of a sudden there's this new part of my job that I didn't know was going to exist before, which is um, mixing for streaming. Yeah. And, you know, and again, actually... I, I, I would want to reiterate just one more thing. It's like, you know, you may come across different um, values of loudness. Doesn't mean you have to deliver each one specifically. You can be in the ballpark and, you know, still, because that's the key. You don't, you know, it shouldn't be. Completely you might be sitting there, right? So you might be sitting there where like, this is my YouTube uh, matrix. This is my Facebook matrix. This is my <laughs> matrix is going off to the BBC and they're all in different, you know, you could, you could be doing that. Yeah, you could. If you, if it was a rainy afternoon and you didn't have much to do. Sorry, Chris, well, that, I interrupted you. I think no, you were that, asking that, another question. Actually, Actually, that leads very nicely, as if we scripted it. Uh, that actually leads nicely. <laughs> if, if we'd scripted into, this, it would have been a lot smoother, it. man. <laughs> <laughs> we did. So, actually, let's let's call this the last question, right? Um, so actually, what, what it comes down to is, you know, specifically for, for live sound engineers, I guess, you know, we're responsible for the mix that goes out into the house. Uh, yeah. You know, then we now we need to record as well, and now you're adding this to this, right? So, yeah. question. Do we really need to know all of this as well now? Uh, uh, no, we don't really need to know all of this, but I'll tell you what we do need to, to know is how to get a gig when all of this finishes, right? There's a lot of unemployed sound engineers at the moment. Um, and I think when we all go back to work again, um, there's going to be more engineers than there are gigs for a while. Um, and I think what might be something that we need to be aware of is 
our artists have been sat at home streaming from their their living rooms with their acoustic guitars, right? And and they've they've discovered this and they love this. Oh, well, we can. Do this. It's a whole new world out there. This whole streaming world. Um, and when they go back on tour, man, you 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 know if somebody's that every concert is going to be streamed someplace or other, and that might be a that might be some way that they make some money because we might not be able to have full concert halls. We might have half full concert halls, but we can make up some money by sending streaming so no you don't have to do this and and you know I, i'm with you when i you know yeah we mix we record to pro tools we archive those recordings we edit, edit we you know do you remember i played that piano part six months ago in, in vienna can you find that and send it to me please we do all of that stuff as part of our job yeah this is another thing they're going to ask us to do for sure i bet you they don't give us any more money for doing it uh but it might be a competitive advantage that you have if if you have this in your armor if you go listen you know i can record to pro tools i can archive i can mix i'll give you i'll give you mixes i can stream i understand about loudness because she explained it in a really great way i don't know i you know i think it's something that we're going to need i might be 100 percent wrong and we might have wasted all of our time but i suspect in our industry it's going to be something you need to know uh like we didn't really need to know about smart till a few years ago. Now we do. We, and then the next thing, actually, <laughs> we, we do need to understand, for example, is networking. So we went from analog to digital, and then the next jump is going to be digital to networking. And kind of slickly, the next webinar that we're doing, Chris, right, in a couple of weeks is the same demystifying networking for live sound. Um, so in two weeks from now, that's the next one that we're going to do. Um, Shreed, yeah. anything you wanted to add to that? I mean, you that. summed it up. You summed it up beautifully, Rob. I mean, the whole reason I actually went, we did geek out a bit on this, and the reason for that is, we shouldn't. We should make an informed decision. We should know what the meters are telling us and what we need to do with that. And like you said, at the end of the day, everyone's a creative person. If if you're an engineer, if you're an artist, you're all creative. And the reason you are called in for a gig is not really, not just because of your creators, but also because of your knowledge of how to yeah. execute that particular thing. And uh, in, in, in that sense, I think you're bang on. And uh, another thing I also wanted to say was, you know, I know, like Chris said, there's been a lot of people on the stream as well. Uh, and I want to sincerely thank them for sitting for like one and a half hours listening to a lot of stuff on Geek uh, that is geeked out as well. Um, but hopefully it was also uh, enjoyable. And uh, you know, I can see Rob smiling, so that's a big. Thing. I'm smiling. I'm smiling. I'm, you know, I'm smiling. I'm smiling because I just want so nice to see your face. I love you so much, and it's great to meet you, even if we're I don't know how many thousand kilometers apart. We are I'm in Spain, you're in Dubai. We're a long way apart, but it's, it's been great to spend the afternoon, you man. And I hope. The next time we see each other, we're going to have a cocktail in our hands. Um, that's it for us, right? Um, thank you so much for attending this. This this will be uh, posted up onto the Tinter web on YouTube or something. I have a YouTube channel at some point in the future. Um, also, if you're attending this, um, the PowerPoint deck that, that Shri used, we're going to send that to you because just so that's a... a it might be a nice reference. It might not be, but if uh, we'll send you a link to download it if you, if you want it. Uh, so that's it. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, James Baker, for keeping an eye on the Q&A. Thanks, Sarah, for hosting it. Thanks, Sri, for, for just being your usual genius self. And uh, see you soon, man. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Goodbye. Cheers.